Hey everybody, in this video I'll look at dampers. I have made a video about car setup before, a different look into sort of most of the car setup things. Link down below, do watch that if you haven't seen it already. But today dampers, sort of a mythical subject in car setup and to some the most important thing on the car, to some meh. Uh, but you see some typical explanations of this topic, the dampers, and I don't do typical. We will do an atypical different look at dampers and perhaps you will get some new insights and some things you didn't know before. So I think you've never seen this explanation anywhere else, but perhaps you have and I'm just the one who didn't find it. Anyway, I hope you find it interesting. I hope uh, it will make you wiser. Who knows? So what is a damper actually? Well, here is a typical coilover as it's often called. So we have a spring and a damper and what does each thing do? A spring will give you a resistance force, a, a counter force that grows the further you compress the spring. So it's based on the position, the length of the spring. The shorter you compress it, the harder it pushes back. Dampers, when it's static, do nothing. They change their force, they counter the force based on how fast the suspension is moving. So one side here is mounted to suspension to the tire and the other side is mounted to the chassis of the car. So dampers are speed control for the movement of your suspension and springs develop a counter force based on how far it is deflected. It grows with deflection. So spring uh, deflection based force and dampers are velocity movement based forces. A very, very common way to look at the dampers is something like you see here, I borrowed this from the interwebs, is a critical damping is a term that's often used. And then if you're below critical damping or above critical damping, well, what happens? Well, I mentioned the spring on its own is sort of eternally bouncy and a car without dampers is terrible. And the level of damping is a function of how much weight is on the damper and on the spring a few other things and then the critical damping here is 1.0 it's a light blue line here so you get deflection and it doesn't overshoot it doesn't wobble it sort of nicely uh, arrives at its final position without overshoot and the less damping you use so 0 0.7 0 0.5 0 0.2 the more sort of oscillation uh, you get so that is very a typical way to look at and to tune perhaps dampers um, in a sim you don't know what the setting that you're going to apply will actually be in critical damping. It also depends on the spring rate. So when you change springs, you might have to change dampers, but you don't know if it's critical or half critical or twice critical. So that's a problem. Another problem though, this doesn't always apply. It's super simple. Yes, it's kind of how dampers work in a simple spring mass damper system, but on a race car, any car, this doesn't often happen. So be astonished, maybe, when we look at this video. So here we have uh, two MX-5s here, arriving at a constant speed, and then we hit the brakes, and just have a look at the motion of the car, both cars. Hit the brakes, and we stop. You see the top one is like a, a boat, it wobbles, right? And the, the lower one isn't. Let's see that one more time. Hit the brakes, the below one instantly arrives at, and then boom, it settles way quicker. What do you think the damping ratios are? You might say the top one was very boaty, so it has way less damping because it oscillates, and the lower one has very tight damping, perhaps critical damping. No, they have the same dampers. So what's going on here? Well, the problem with the mass damper that we saw in, that, in the picture here, this is for vertical motion. And what I don't see a lot of people talking about, but of course people know that, but it's not quite as common to see, is inertia. So when things move, a heavy thing moves, you feel its weight pushing a shopping trolley down the supermarket, uh, lifting something vertically, then you feel the weight. But when it rotates, when something heavy rotates, you don't feel the weight, you feel the inertia. So if you have a stick in front of, in front of you with some weights, very close by, it's easy to twist. But the further away you place those weights, the thing weighs the same, but now it's a lot harder to, to twist. So the inertia of the car, which is very different based on front engines uh, with a rear differential and gearbox, heavy things to the outside, 
or mid-engined with the gearbox attached, the inertia of the car makes a fair difference. Now, in this video here, it is definitely uh, overdone a little bit, but you can see the same damping ratio since braking the car pitches is not movement of the car, it is rotation of the car. You see that the damping looks to be very, very different, even though the damping ratios are the same. So inertia plays a big role. And let's, let's have a look at roll as well, because this was pitch and now let's turn. So in this video, you will see the car turning way, one way and then yank the other way. You can see the top one is very wobbly. Look at the change of direction on the top one. It even goes on two wheels. Whoa. And if you look at the lower one, it's very stable and tight. It instantly sort of, yeah, there's, there's a lot of body roll. This is not a racing car, it's very soft suspension, but it looks way more damped again. So even here, it's the inertia. That's the difference overdone. But just to show you that the little spring damper charge that we see, that these are not necessarily always applying because when we rotate the car in roll or in pitch, this isn't the total picture. So that's first thing I wanted to show you. The second thing I'd like to talk about is that what people often say is you feel the dampers during transition because we've mentioned before when the damper isn't moving, it doesn't add any force, only when it's moving. So when you go from that left turn into the right turn, then you get the body roll. So during those insta instant of couple tenths or one second that you are rolling, that's when the dampers do something. Um, that makes a lot of sense, but can we put that into perspective, right? Uh, how important is it? What changes to the car handling if we tune the dampers differently and have another one of those steering event events from pulling full right, full left, look at the car balance with different dampers. Well, let's have a look. Sharp left. And then at the same time, sharp right. You can see the lower one rolls a little bit slower and it moves a bit more. Especially when it turns right here, it seems to rotate a bit more, get a bit more oversteer there. So what happens in this case, uh, the top one has the same front and rear damping ratios, those wiggly lines that we saw er earlier, and the bottom one has three times the damping on the rear uh, tires than it has on the front tires. So it's quite a big difference. And those stiffer dampers overall, they reduce the speed of the roll and they seem to cause oversteer. So why is that? It always helps to look at telemetry. What are we looking at here? These are the two examples. So the, the bottom video with the seemingly oversteery car is the top line here, the purple line and the other car, which seems more stable, is the black line. We are plotting yaw rate, so that's effectively just rotation. If you have a yaw rate of 360 degrees per second, you do one rotation, which is pretty fast actually, that's a lot quicker than racing cars do, but that's just the rotation of the car when viewed from above, how much does it turn per second. So we see here uh, an event, uh, here we steer, here we are, hard one hand, one side and then here we turn the steering wheel from one fully fully one way to fully the other way and we can see that the yaw rate on the car with the stiffer rear damping is a lot higher and then it gets reduced and then it, it oscillates a little bit and that's the oversteer and more yaw rate is more more rotation it feels like the thing is rotating faster so here the dampers have quite a big, big effect, but you also saw the suspension was really, really soft. And um, it also sort of oscillates, it's not, not really nice, but it definitely is true that during the roll, the dampers have an effect. But why are stiffer rear dampers more oversteery in this case? Well, the dampers, they resist motion. And imagine the rear being stiffer and resisting the motion, it pushes back harder. That means the outside rear tire will get a lot more load on it because the front suspension with a lot less damping doesn't really care if it rolls, it, it will absorb it without a lot of counter force, but the rear counters it firmly. So we get more difference in the tire loads 
uh, on the rear than on the front, which results, if we look at the tire loads, it is a little bit technical, but you can clearly see it. Same transition here. We can see that the tire loads on the colored lines here, on the rear tires, shoot up and they are higher initially. So when we make that transition, uh, the rear outside tire has a higher load on it with stronger damping than it has with less damping. On the front it is reversed because it sees less load because the rear is doing all the work. So the front uh, tire sees less load when we have more rear damping. And what does that even mean? You know, okay, the tire has more or less load on it. Well, there's this thing called load sensitivity. And I've talked about it in other videos. It basically means that the more you load a tire, well, if you double the load on the tire, you do not get double the grip, not quite, it's less. So the more it comes down to that, the more evenly you can load your inside and outside tires, the more grip your axle will have. And under or oversteer is not about one tire, it's about the front two tires versus the rear two tires. So the front axle versus the rear axle. And the more evenly the tires are loaded on one axle, the more grip it has. And by having stiff dampers, we see a very big difference in the outside rear tire and the inside rear tire load. So that's not equal at all. And that because of load sensitivity should give us less grip at the rear axle than on the front axle. We can see the difference here. We have about 50 uh, degrees per second with the stiff rear dampers and about a peak of 40 degrees per second rotation with the softer rear dampers, equal front and rear dampers. So that's a, a 1.25 increase of your peak rotation rate from increasing the rear dampers uh, by three times. However, very soft suspension. Now let's stiffen up the suspension and do a few more of these tests. Now we have actual racing car suspension uh, for the technology nerds out there. Three and a half hertz suspension rates. That's quite stiff, but then again, it's not that special. GT cars have probably a bit more with bump rubbers. It's stiff, but it's within racing car spec. Just how does this look? Just have a brief look here. You can see there's a lot less body roll. There were no entry roll bars in the previous case, also not here. So this is more what you expect from a racing car, right? A lot less roll. So let's repeat the experiment then with equal front and rear dampers and then with the dampers on the rear that are three times stiffer. And in order to make it even uh, more pronounced, rear dampers that are five times stiffer than the front dampers. And here we have that case again, we are fully steering one way. And when this starts to change, we are steering the other way. Look at the rotation of the car. So with equal front and rear dampers, we have the lowest line here. And then with triple the rear damping, we have the black line is slightly above. And with the green line, we have five times the rear damping. So what is very interesting here is that previously we saw a 25% difference in that car rotation rate when we went with triple the rear dampers but now we barely see like it's five percent difference something like that the reason is the suspension is now way stiffer so the car spends way less time rolling so these dampers have way less time to do something and you can see that it's barely well it is a difference obviously but the difference is way smaller so with stiffly sprung racing cars the difference the dampers make in transition, so we steering from one side to the other, is actually not that big, really. Uh, so just something to keep in mind that yes, dampers do that in theory and also in practice, but on a racing car that is stiffly sprung, the differences might not be that big. You know, a five times increase in damping is a lot. You know, that's not often even possible with dampers uh, on on racing cars, such a big a range that you can adjust. However, the thing I want to stress here the most is that, okay, so the dampers work during the roll of the car, for example, when you change direction, but who's changing direction? That's you, the driver, you're turning the steering wheel. So now let's look at another interesting situation here. So what do you have to do with your steering input to compensate for a five times stiffer rear damper? Well, glad you asked. Here we have the telemetry. So we at the, at the left here, 
steering one way and as these curves start to move we are steering the other way so what i've done is at center steering steer the lower curve here this is the steering position one way and then turns the other way when the steering wheel is centered i've you know i've equalized these these uh, curves here and what we can see now by steering slower the actual yaw rates the rotation of the car is now just about you know the peaks are equal they occur at a slightly different time but they're very equal in in rotation rate so we get the same car rotation but we are looking at five times different rear dampers and the thing we've done is we are steering a little slower you can see the red line here takes a bit more time for the steering to go from center all the way there and the black line we steer quicker so by steering slower with five times stiffer damping we can get the same car rotation the response is a little different but the total rotation velocity the peak velocity is about the same what is this difference though that's the time when this steering maximizes and the time this one maximizes so this one maxis maximizes around here that's 16.975 and the other one maximizes around here 17.162 so 0.17 seconds is that correct you can see it's a very very short time so doing this or doing that <laughs> it's almost almost the same so very very subtle change in your steering speed inputs in this case have the same effect ish as a five times difference in rear damping so yeah those transitions are times where the dampers work but you control the speed of these transitions and yes the dampers do something but you do probably more with the speed of your steering input so that's i think a very interesting thing to take away from this part next topic is the assumption that once you are steering steady state the dampers are no longer really working that much so the dampers do not influence sort of the steady state behavior only the transients when you're from left to right or braking from accelerating those things but not really when a, when you're doing a constant a cornerings for example uh, that's an interesting thing that i think i can disprove but let's have some slightly bumpy track you know what does it look like well let's look at the video here so yeah it's got some bumps it's not not seabring so how can we measure whether we can get a change in balance so what about again having an even front and rear damping and then triple rear damping it's very hard to look at telemetry here because the g-forces and stuff will be very bouncy we can however time how long it takes to do a few revolutions and see if one of these two cars is quicker at completing a couple of revolutions than the other car so let's have a look at that telemetry so what are we looking at here well an overlay again time here and then we are driving circles a few circles and this is the rotation of the car which is sort of goes back to zero every time you do a revolution this is something with pi i like i like pi so i don't argue with pi so we start here at the same exact moment then we do some re some rotations right and you can see that one car is a little quicker at completing these rotations it's very hard to see after one rotation but if we do a couple more here at the end we can see there is a little time difference it's small between these two cars so one has very stiff front dampers and soft rear dampers and the other has the other way around uh, which is the other way around <laughs> uh, why would this make a difference is the difference big no i think these are three rotations or one and a half i get confused with pi i like i like to eat more pi so let's make it three rotations so here we are roughly at 43.75 seconds and the other one is 43.9 so it's only one or two tenths of a second quicker at completing these rotations so the difference is very small but we do see a difference and the reason for that is these bumps they make the dampers work of course because the suspension works and the dampers work so stiff rear dampers just like we've seen before uh, get more uneven rear axle loading 
more higher, higher loaded outside rear tire from the stiff damper that doesn't want to comply with the, with the bumps. So we have ever so slightly less rear grip, we get ever so slightly more rotation. So with stiff rear dampers, we finish the rotations quicker than with stiff front dampers and soft rear dampers. But the difference is really small. So you could argue, well, in this case, the sort of true, right? Once you're steady state cornering, the dampers don't do a whole lot. However, we don't have small bumps every now and then. We've got big bumps, say Sebring, for example. So now look what happens. Sebring level of bumps, you see it's really quite bouncy. Front and rear dampers are equal. Fairly compliant, 50% critical front rear dampers, 3.5 Hz suspension frequency, if you want to know the details. Okay, so cool. Uh, what about increasing the rear dampers a factor of 3? So now we have 3 times stiffer rear dampers, 150% of critical damping on the rear, 50% of critical damping on the front. We already saw that is critical damping a thing when you also have pitch and roll, but a good, a good thing to try, right? So here we are. Oh, oh, oh. We spin out. So steady state cornering, where of course all the guides you read and all the information you see is has to make assumptions. But on a very bumpy track, it is definitely not true that steady state cornering, that the dampers have lost their work. They can still be working in bumps and that can still make the side that is stiffer uh, in damping lose grip compared to the side that has softer damping. So here, triple damping on the back, a third of the damping on the front if you wish. The car actually spins out versus equal damping front and rear where it was nicely balanced and understeery. So dampers definitely do uh, have a big effect mid-corner when you think they might not based on the bumps you might encounter. Now, of course, it's just fairly extreme, but this looked a bit like Sebring. Sebring does happen, and perhaps, you know, you only need one big bump mid-corner to perhaps upset the car enough to notice that. So, yeah, uh, it's probably not correct to assume that mid-corner your damper settings no longer work. They are still probably quite important. The bumpier the track, uh, the more important it is. And also the speed you're going, of course, the quicker you go through that turn, the harder the hit on the suspension. So I think this is quite interesting. Again, this is a different way of looking at it. And you can see, whoa, we, 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 we spun out. And that goes against some of the things you may have read. So I hope that it's interesting to see this happen. One more thing left. Actually, two things left. I can't count. That must inspire confidence for you, viewer. Anyway, two things left. Uh, you often hear that you get slow speed damping and high speed damping. Low and high speed damping can often be adjusted separately in the car setup on real dampers as well. And you, you hear that the low speed damping is more for the transients that when you're cornering you're giving your inputs and the high speed dampers are more for sudden hits like curb stones and things like that. So if the car gets upset too much by a curb stone, what you do, you might reduce the fast dampers and leave the slow dampers uh, settings alone. What does a damper curve look like? Well, again, we don't know because in your sim you probably don't have an actual curve. You just go from setting 5 to 8 and then hope for the best. Um, here you can see the green lines are the lowest line. Here is the minimum damping setting and the highest green line is the maximum setting and the red line is the currently selected setting, average, so, so to speak. We have on the horizontal, the speed of the damper. So how fast is it moving in and out? And vertical axis is the, f the force that it resists this movement with. And we can see with higher settings here, the top green line, that if the damper speeds up to 0.1 meters per second, then we get a little bit over 3000 Newton of counter force. So the faster we move on, on this axis, the higher the damping force, the more that speed will be resisted by the damper. Um, and this, there's a kink here, which is where this, the low speed damping goes into the high speed damping. So if you adjust the high speed damping, then you see, hey, now we have no high speed damping anymore. It stays constant or you want to in increase it. And now you have a lot of high speed damping. So you tune these lines separately. You might go for more damping 
or less damping on the low speed side you know that's how you what the curves might change like when you adjust low and high speed dampers um, and the assumption that when you take a curb stone you need to adjust the high speed dampers isn't wrong like a lot of the things that people say about dampers aren't wrong necessarily but you have to be very very careful about a couple of things you do not know typically what sort of speed do we go from the low speed to the high speed dampers it could be at 0.1 meters per second or a lot less or a lot more it might that that transition speed might even change with damper settings depending on your damper on your race car or in your sim so you don't know what that speed is where it it, it crosses over so it really depends how hard you hit something how fast the suspension moves whether you are actually in the high speed dampers or still in the low speed part of the dampers and there are ways where the low speed dampers might be dominant so you change the high speed dampers but if you have very stiff low speed dampers and you hit a curb let's say you get 0.2 meters per second of suspension speed and you have a lot of low speed damping ah, you, you, your car gets upset right so we're at 0.2 3500 newtons here okay let's reduce the fast dampers all right so now we do go uh, down from 35 ish what was it here we go down a bit but the majority of the damper force comes from the low speed dampers when we are only at this speed so low speed dampers also affect handling over curbs they are not separated completely on perhaps some dampers effectively it might be perhaps you know the, the the quicker the suspension moves the softer it is for example or the less damping you have uh, if we are here at 45 centimeters per second motion yes and we change the fast dampers to this and then we adjust them down to this that's a very big change right so here the damper force will double or something like that so it really depends but you cannot isolate too simply the low speed and the high speed damping taking curbs you still feel the low speed dampers and high low speed uh, damper rates will also uh, be felt over curb stones because they will give more resistance to movement initially and that force has to be overcome there will always be the force in the damper for the low speed damper and the high speed damper yeah you can see how much do you add on top of the low speed damper but the low speed dampers are always active so they always play a role even when taking curbs my final point for this video is the damper histograms that you can uh, plot with Motec here uh, and other telemetry software and I see people use this in, in YouTube videos where they seem to go for a certain shape of these curves again a very brief description of what we are looking at this is a full lap uh, in this case at Spa in an LMP2 car and then you know every one hundredth of a second you take note okay the damper is moving this fast the damper is moving this fast and then you make brackets like okay let's say the very low speed a little bit higher speed how often uh, of all the samples that we make while the car is doing the lap so we have thousands of samples where uh, during the lap how fast the damper is moving how often uh, is it moving this fast how often is it moving a little faster how often is it moving a little faster so how much of the lap really in, in time is spent at a certain damper velocity uh, and typically people tune this to look a certain way and i've not really used this all that much and i don't i haven't really you know i simplify the dampers to the point where i'm not so sure if i need to use it this way but you can also fall in a couple of traps um, when the middle is high like here on the front suspension there uh, is a lot of time spent with the dampers moving very slowly and here at the rear it's less peaky and the dampers move over a wider range of speed more of the time i don't really know what to make of this though because uh, here uh, the trap is what should it look like what is better you know all you see here that the front suspension spends more time barely moving than the rear suspension because this middle bar is barely moving and the rear suspension has a less of a peak than the front but what does that mean what should we do with the car setup uh, how does that feel i don't think you can really say and there are a couple of caveats you might look at this and say well 
if this if you consider the, the rear suspension here to be good and this is too peaky well then we have to reduce from damping to allow it to move a bit more freely and perhaps that gives us more grip or something you know but we've already seen that the side with the stiffer dampers will give uh, less grip to that side so if we reduce the damping on the front we might get more oversteer in the car perhaps we don't even want that so i don't know how you you cannot just tune this shape you know you have to know what you want to do to the car uh, and plus even though we've looked at dampers and they have an effect it's not compared to aero and springs and anti roll bars the effect might be small depending on a million things but it's not the only thing you change on the car setup of course so why would you tune this a certain way a big thing here uh, lmp2 car has a very very stiff front suspension and stiff suspensions they tend to move a lot less and you get lower uh, damping speeds so i think it would just be normal for a super stiff suspension that barely moves uh, like in distance to also have uh, more sort of a peaky uh, damper histogram here and the rear suspension which is more free to move will also move faster more of the time so this is not a wrong front suspension or, or a, a correct rear suspension they're just very different front and rear suspensions on this car and there's no i don't see any reason to tune anything to make these look more equal or, or, or different now perhaps uh, something i won't go into in this video is that with bump and rebound because here on this side is bump this side is rebound you can get some idea if your damper is effectively stuck uh, perhaps in, in one of the two directions and moves too freely in the others you can see the, the bumper rebound uh, correlation here seeing this I don't know what's wrong I don't know what I should do uh, so yeah you see people tweak this uh, and perhaps if this is a wobbly mess you know if, if there is a lot of sort of equal bar height from left to right so the suspension is just moving at low speed and high speed as much you could argue there's not as much control over there but perhaps it's a super bumpy track and that works for you there i don't know how to relate a damper histogram into what you know, what shape do you want what do you need there's some use to it i'm sure like i said perhaps looking at the bump and, and the rebound differences which are sort of symmetrical ish here uh, perhaps you can do something there it depends too much on the handling of the car the suspension stiffness this will look different and it's not something it's not this is not the magic thing to tweak and then you have a great handling car i don't really see the point that much but i'm also just me and perhaps there are ways to use this very usefully right so i think i'll leave it here for this video uh, a couple of things we did not go into like i just mentioned bump and rebound damping i just had the bump and rebound dampers in uh, exactly the same value you can just those separately we might do that in the future but i wanted to not do that for this video um, other uh, conclusions then so we saw that the inertia of the car the resistance to rotation for braking or against roll also affect the damping and that's interesting because uh, when the car pitches when braking and when it rolls the inertias are very very different it's very easy for the pitch inertia of a car to be three, four, five times greater than the roll inertia. Why am I mentioning this? Well, we didn't talk about anti-roll bars. Most racing cars have them and they stiffen up the suspension. And when you have a stiffer suspension, you might need more damping. So it is very typical or fairly smart, you could say that, well, when I'm rolling, the suspension is stiffer because of the anti-roll bar. Do I need more dampers? Well. I think we are a bit lucky here because the roll inertia of the car which also affects the boat feeling uh, in roll is a lot smaller than the pitch inertia so that's good to have in mind and that perhaps you don't need a lot of extra damping uh, with a stiff anti-roll bar because the roll inertia of the car is lower so you get less of a boat effect and it feels more damped because of that and the pitch inertia is greater so when braking and accelerating uh, the pitch has a more pronounced effect on the dampers but then you don't have anti pitch bars you don't you just have the springs uh, you don't have anti roll bars acting when you're braking so that's an interesting thing and uh, probably explains why a lot of the time uh, in roll the car isn't very undamped perhaps because the roll inertia is much smaller than the pitch inertia of the car second thing to look at uh, pitch 
braking. Uh, you know, what happens? Did you know that on a lot of GT cars, uh, high downforce cars in general, the front suspension almost does not move when you brake? You would expect the tires to go up, but with anti-dive as some suspension geometry trickery, you can make it so that when you hit the brakes, the front suspension does not move. The nose might still go down because the tire gets squished a little bit from the weight transfer. Uh, the rear might go up depending on its geometry. It might also not go up at the rear. You know that suspension geometry, magic. You can have a completely static car when you hit the brakes super hard. The rear does not come up. The front does not go down. So tuning front dampers on a modern downforce car, if you want to sort of control the, the pitch of the car, well, on many, many cars that won't have any effect because there is no suspension movement and dampers do not work when they are not being moved. So front suspensions, especially on the braking, almost no compression, almost no movement, no damper action. Rear suspensions, little different, but also reduced typically they reduce the effect of the rear rising and the braking by changing the geometry. Why? Uh, well, this is more about aero uh, stability, I think, and it's just a way to, to design your suspension. But it's good to keep in mind that that damper control for the transients like mid corner and braking and accelerating, we saw two things. Your inputs matter, right? Steering a little bit slower will slow down that weight transfer uh, just as much as going with a fifth or five times more or less damping at the rear. We saw that. So don't forget that the transients from left to right, from accelerating to braking are your inputs. And if you in speed, speed those up or slow those down, that has a possibly bigger effect than the dampers. Not that the dampers don't do what people say they do, but they don't just do what that, you know, you also influence, influence it yourself. Then we saw that the difference with a soft suspension and a racing suspension is quite large. We saw 25% more oversteer when we tripled the rear dampers on a soft car. And then with a stiff racing car, we did the same and we barely saw any change. When we did the direction change, the change in handling and oversteer was far less pronounced with the stiff suspension. So yes, it made a difference, but we, we also saw that just steering ever so slightly slower with super stiff dampers gave us roughly the same result in oversteer as steering faster with uh, less damping. So good to keep in mind that stiff cars have less suspension movement, spend less time in transients and under braking, the front suspension might not even do anything. So don't overstate the importance of those transients and how much the dampers, dampers influence it on a stiff racing car. Then with the bumpy track, we saw that on a mildly bumpy track, even just turning, driving in circles, we, there is a tiny bit of difference uh, because Again, the side with the stiffer dampers will lose grip. So if you go over bump steady state, the side that is stiffer, if the front is stiffer than the rear, you will get a bit more understeer and you will have a bit less grip, but it's not pronounced. However, we also saw that on Sebring level bumps or incidental, like a, a big bump somewhere or a curb, uh, we did get the car to just spin out with stiff rear dampers and soft front dampers where it was understeery, just going around in circles and circles with stiff front dampers and softer rear dampers. The argument that steady state handling, you know, the dampers do something, you, you hear this quite a lot. It doesn't mean that it's the only thing people say, uh, but you do hear it fairly often that dampers work during transients, where we've said, well, yes, they do. On race cars, perhaps not that much. And you control the speed of the transient with your hands and feet. So meh but they don't work as much in uh, steady state cornering is often said or steady state braking or acceleration. Well, if the track is bumpy enough, at some point they might become quite uh, noticeable in that over the bumps, the stiffer side, again, the stiffer damped side will lose more grip. If the rear is more damped than the front, you go over a lot of bumps, you might get oversteer instability over those bumps. That's a good thing to keep uh, in mind as well. Then the point of slow and, and, and fast damper settings that you can often do. Just for, don't forget that the low speed dampers will always, that stage will always be there. The force generated in the low speed stage is still there when you take a curb. So increasing the low speed damping will also make your ride over curb stones rougher uh, and more upsetting to the car. It's not just the high speed dampers that tune the behavior of the car over curbs. 
The biggest problem here is we do not typically know the damper curves of your sim or, or your real car sometimes even. So you don't really know what speeds do you get from the damper when it, when it hits a curb stone and what sort of force in the force curve are we getting there and how much difference does the low speed damper make there and how much difference does the high speed damper make there. Just know that high speed damping isn't a pure curb stone adjustment. Low speed dampers are still affecting it. More damping is a bigger hit from sudden inputs, even if it's low speed damping. They have to be taken into account. And finally, a brief look at the histograms that, well, I'm sure there are ways to do something useful with it. And I mentioned a couple of things perhaps, but I don't really understand what they do in order to uh, improve your car, for example. And there are so many differences there. The stiffer car will have a different ideal shape there if there is an ideal shape. Uh, than a softer car, for example. I hope that was interesting. Um, and to round this out, well, okay, now with all this in mind, how do you set up the dampers, Niels? Good question. So I've always simplified the dampers to a reasonable extent and I think with this video at least there is some level of evidence. I'm sure you can argue with everything. We're, there is a time and a place to do that in the comments. Uh, there is that, that, that magical, mystical talk about dampers, how they do everything. Well, I just look at it quite simple. You need dampers, otherwise the car is just a bouncing, oscillating mess. So yes, you need dampers and then there in my opinion, it's probably quite a range where they don't really affect things uh, too much. The takeaway for me has always been that the side with the stiffer dampers, just like having a stiffer suspension, is going to be a bit less grippy than the side with softer dampers. It's not the only thing that plays a role, of course, springs, uh, anti-roll bars, everything plays a role. On a bumpy track, uh, it is a difference that stiffer dampers lose more grip on that side. So stiff rear dampers oversteer, stiff front dampers understeer. To some extent, right? And I never really tuned the dampers for the transients. You know, going from left to right, stepping on the brakes. Because I control those transients with my steering wheel and my pedals. And I do not control the bumps and stuff mid-corner. They are just a function of how fast I am going over these bumps, they will create inputs. So I treat dampers more sort of for actually a mid corner or everywhere uh, active thing that slightly affects under and oversteer rather than just something that responds to my inputs as much because my inputs I can adjust, uh, but my speed for the corner, if I'm going fast has to be a certain speed and that speed will upset the suspension over the bumps uh, and that will mean that stiffer dampers on the front give you more understeer. So I tune the dampers barely actually uh, because they don't make a huge effect once they're sort of in a normal range. You absolutely need them and they don't need to be super like mega hard that they don't allow the suspension to move but there's a fair range in my opinion where they work. And more compliant dampers uh, are simply uh, often front and rear soft dampers might work better on bumpy tracks. And then it's more a slight adjustment of front and rear grip by uh, adding or removing dampers front and rear. I haven't really gone super deep into it when I change the setup because the springs, anti-roll bars uh, and ride height effects with downforce cars with bump rubbers and packer gaps, wing angles, pitch of the car, that sort of stuff has a far bigger effect in my opinion than, than the dampers. So my talent is not good enough, I think, to feel the difference between subtle damper changes. So I hope my sort of rules of thumb and this video explain things in a different way than you've seen before. And perhaps it's a little bit useful, perhaps not so much. I'm curious to, to hear your reactions. Of course, I've left out things. I made mistakes and there are things I don't know. So post things in the comments and thanks for watching. And yeah, the lighting is different. This is a uh, day two of the video. So that's how serious I am. Multiple hours. Jeez. Bye guys. Thanks for watching.